Hello, my, my name is Marty Bacall, and I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar, How to Leverage Your IBM I Applications in New Channels. Not only will this be a great talk about offering mobile applications and automation process leveraging your on-premise infrastructure, we'll also discuss how even cows benefit from this modernization. Before getting started, before getting started introducing our speakers, um, I'd like some quick housekeeping. Q&A will happen at the end of the webinar, but please enter any questions you have when you think of them with using the Q&A tab. Also, feel free to tweet using the pound sign IBM I symbol. So now I'm going to introduce our speakers. First, I'm Alex Woody, C Senior Editor, IT Jungle. Alex has been covering the IBM I ecosystem for 18 years. He became the products editor at AS400 Technology Showcase before joining IT Jungle just after its founding in 2001. He is also the managing editor, editor of D Data Nami. Next, we have um, Zev Ave Avedon, Chief Product Officer, Open Legacy. Zev has been involved with the concept of microservices since the early days of EAI and SOA. Over the, la over the past 20 years, he has seen firsthand the pitfalls and challenges with integration and legacy systems. And the third speaker is myself, Martin Bacall, Product Marketing Director of Open Legacy. My focus is shortening development life cycles. Over the last 25 years, I've supported agile development, OAD, modeling, VNV, testing, and other methodologies to achieve this goal. Now I'll pass it over to Alex to, to discuss the challenges facing IBM I development. All right, thanks, Marty. Um, yeah, I wanna say thanks to uh, Open Legacy and to uh, you and, and Zev for inviting me uh, to today's webinar. Um, uh, as, as you said, I've been covering uh, IBM Midrange for 20 years, and uh, I also uh, am the managing editor at Datanami, uh, where I cover big data and AI. So hopefully I have some insights um, that can help you. Um, so the, uh, the current situation, as the screen says, um, it's, it's not bad. Uh, it's in fact what many IBM I shops uh, like you have been living with for years, if not decades. It's basically the status quo. Uh, you're probably running an RPG or COBOL application that's sturdy and reliable and secure and fits your company like a glove. It's, it's probably 10 to 20, maybe even 30 years old, and it runs year after year after year, and it might be so predictable that it's actually boring. Companies like yours rely on these IBM I programs to automate their most critical business processes. Uh, this includes general business functions like billing, accounts, receivable, shipping, human resources, uh, and depending on the industry, the, the AS400 or IBM I supports more specific functions like make to order manufacturing um, in manufacturing, route optimization in logistics, merchandise planning in the retail business. In banking, there's uh, transaction reconciliation uh, and insurance companies have all kinds of risk assessment uh, programs that they run. These, these applications originated in really one of two ways. Uh, they were either hand rolled from scratch by a team of in-house developers or even a single developer. This was pretty common uh, in the early days of the mid-range. Or uh, companies acquired the, the, the solutions as a packaged ERP suite from an enterprise software company. In a lot of cases, they were heavily modified from that point. But the important thing to realize is that these systems, in many cases, are the backbone of the company and they handle the most critical processes in, uh, that the company is involved with. If, the, if these processes go down, if the server goes down, the whole business goes down. Um, but uh, there are obviously some drawbacks of heritage systems like this. Uh, things aren't all hunky-dory or we wouldn't be here today. The big challenge that so many IBM I shops are facing is that their core enterprise applications aren't meeting today's business requirements. And this is for a variety of both internal and external reasons. So let's tackle both of them. So some of the internal challenges um, are, have to do with the system itself. Maybe, maybe the old application, you know, I prefer the term heritage system as opposed to legacy. I think, I think legacy has kind of a negative take to it. Uh, a lot of these old applications have only 5250 green screens. And uh, perhaps the company wants a graphical interface because it's easier to train new workers. Or maybe the company needs a mobile interface to let field workers uh, be able to access the system and input data. Yeah, the appearance of 5250 screens leaves a lot to be desired, obviously. Although some hardcore keyboard loving data entry folks still prefer uh, 5250 screens over GUIs because they can enter data faster. But it's not always a screen related issue that's, that's holding the IBM I system back. Maybe the company is experiencing difficulty in moving data in or out of the IBM I server. Uh, perhaps for something like business intelligence reporting or, or analytics initiatives. 
Uh, sometimes there's organizational issues, like maybe the company needs to streamline how it presents the buying experience to customers across the multiple channels. And it, a lot of times these touch multiple systems, so uh, the business processes get more complex. Or maybe there's a departmental issue, like the IT department is mandated to move to a DevOps release cycle. You might work in a company that's undergone extensive mergers and acquisitions, which puts all kinds of unanticipated stresses on internal systems. Or you might be under a mandate to move to a new system, or maybe some of the companies that your company has acquired are moving on to the IBM I platform itself. These are examples of uh, internal forces that are driving IBM iShops to modernization, but there's a host of external factors to worry about too. One of the biggest uh, external challenge uh, has to do with some business forces that are, uh, that are gathering kind of on the doorstep here. We've seen how companies like Uber and Airbnb have ridden waves of technological disruption um, that are washing over traditional businesses like taxi cabs and hotel operators. Uh, who's going to be the next company to strike it rich at the expense of an established business? We don't know, but uh, Uber is a good example. Um, the company's preparing for an IPO that some say values the company at $100 billion. And yet the company doesn't even own a single car. It doesn't employ workers in the traditional sense. Um, instead, every Uber driver is a contractor who provides their car as a service through a mobile app. Although maybe with uh, today's strike, who knows what comes out of that. But anyway, uh, Uber's mobile app isn't just any run-of-the-mill mobile app. It's, it's a highly sophisticated piece of digital machinery. It leverages the latest advances in stream data processing, geospatial data, and machine learning to crunch through massive amounts of data to find you the most profitable match between millions of ride-hailing riders and millions of ride-hailing providers. Airbnb has a similar business model with an emphasis on extracting value from previously underutilized assets, like, in a, like a home or a spare room in a home. And while Airbnb hasn't hurt the hotel industry as much as Uber has the cab industry over the last 10 years, thanks to strong economic growth and plenty of demand for, uh, for hotels, there's lots of other companies that are taking notes and they're plotting new digital native business strategies that mirror these two tech bellwethers. <clears throat> and uh, in a lot of ways, these companies are reimagining IT. They're reimagining business. Yeah, and that that's that's too bad because in some ways uh, having a business in the real world is kind of a drag. How can you grow at 10x, which is the minimum growth multiple allowed in Silicon Valley these days, when you actually have to make goods, move in inventory, or maintain large pieces of equipment? The answer is you, you can't really do that in the real world. The high-flying brands of the last 10 years are digital disruptors who have found a way to be the digital middlemen and leave the last mile connection to real world blokes like you. Take Amazon, for example. Earlier this year, Amazon was the largest company in the world. It had a market cap of about $800 billion, which was the biggest until Microsoft went past a trillion a couple weeks ago. Amazon's the largest retailer in the world, but it doesn't own any actual shops, not counting Whole Foods. Instead, it leverages its massive size to get great delivery rates with the US Postal Service and the UPS. This digital trend is not really good news for IBM iShops, a good percentage of which are mid-sized companies in traditional industries like manufacturing, distribution, logistics, retail, banking, and insurance. These organizations tend to have large investments in real-world assets, inventory, and people, and enterprise software is meant to orchestrate the complex interaction among these components. But the digital disruptors aren't burdened with worrying about things that traditional IBM iShops have to worry about, like how to maximize efficiency in a supply chain, how to optimize my space on the retail floor, how to optimize space on the shop floor, how to streamline flow of documents and the approval process in the front office. To the digital disruptors, these are last century problems. They're just too boring to worry about. They figure that they've already been taken care of. They can just get these apps in the cloud somewhere. Instead of concerning themselves with uh, optimizing business the way it used to be done, these, these tech bellwethers, they're busy reimagining it. They've, they're coming up with new rules and new modes of operation. From the banking business to music delivery to food delivery, there's dozens of startups looking to reimagine your industry and disrupt you. Not to be lost in the shuffle is the importance of emerging regulations, especially those around data. Undoubtedly heard about the General Data Reg uh, Protection Regulation, GDPR, which puts strict controls on what businesses can do with European citizens' data. 
that sort of regulation is coming to the US too with the California Consumer Privacy Act, which goes into effect next year. Lots of other countries around the world have similar uh, data regulations too. These regulations are a reminder of how important data has become, not just to the digital innovators who are making money by rearranging bytes on the internet, but also to the real world companies like yours that produce tangible goods and services that humans still need on a daily basis. Figuring out how to implement a data government strategy that adheres with regulations like GDPR and CCPA should be a priority, whether or not you plan to digitally innovate your, yourself. So what does this all mean to IBM iShops? The bottom line is of course the real world still matters. The food that uh, an Uber Eats driver delivers from that Trinity restaurant down the street was originally grown on a farm and it was delivered to a warehouse via truck and that truck was probably dispatched from an IBM I system. Food still can't pack, pick or pack itself, furniture doesn't build or ship itself, manufacturing plants are still going to be required which will keep a big chunk of American business in business at least until we outsource it all to China. So to summarize there's a risk there's a risk and an opportunity here for IBM I shops. The downside risk is that you can get disrupted and some middleman will, with a better app, more Twitter followers, more Facebook likes, or a better grasp of GDPR and data governance figures out how to take the profit out of your supply chain, out of your business, and leave, leave you with uh, a lower value service to provide, a, lower, a less profitable business. But the upside potential for IBM I shops is that you can get in front of the wave and think like a digital disruptor yourself. You can actually, disrupt yourself. That means having a better website, a better mobile app, a better social media strategy, and a firmer grasp on the data regulations than what you've had up to this point. And so that brings us back to modernization. There are, of course, challenges to IBM I shops that want to disrupt themselves. Some of these are technical, others involve financial or personal personnel challenges or uh, changes to business processes. One path has an IBM iShop replacing their customized heritage applications with a brand new system with all the bells and whistles that they're looking for. Whether it's up-to-date web and mobile interfaces, integration with productivity tools, social media extensions, or integrated business analytics. A lot of these run on the cloud too, although not the IBM i applications, obviously. But the cost of this rip and replace approach can be quite high. Over the years, there have been many reports of companies trying to migrate off the IBM I applications and, and servers. Some have done it, but some have reluctantly moved back onto the IBM I applications after spending millions of dollars over many years and failing to actually make the, make the change stick. The other avenue is to modernize your application yourself. This is probably the best route, especially for companies that have written their own applications uh, and to fit their business like a glove. It's, it's also preferable rip and replace for those IBM I shops who started with a package software like BPix, Mapix, System 21, JD Edwards, MacPack, PRMS, MoveX, Infinium, Daily Wolcott, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and have extensively modified them over the years. Whether or not you've developed your own software or modified somebody else's package, you're facing the same challenge. You have a software application that elegantly reflects the business challenges that you have already solved, but they can't easily be migrated or translated into another system. However, that system is not prepared to take your business to the next level, which usually involves some combination of web, mobile interfaces, social media extensions, advanced data analytics, and not to mention more agile uh, software development methods. There's a handful of tools and technologies and techniques out there that can help IBM I shops modernize their applications. One of those comes from Open Legacy, which has taken an innovative approach to IBM I application modernization, in my opinion, that's based on uh, the creation and reuse of web services. So now I'm, uh, I'm uh, pleased to hand the uh, mic over to Zev, who will explain some of the benefits of the open legacy approach. Uh, th thanks Alex for this incredibly insightful description of kind of the state of the industry uh, uh, right now. Uh, and as, as, as Alex said, I mean, right now we are kind of a, at an inflection point where um, if you're in business and if you looking forward, uh, some sometime along the way you come to the realization that um, if you try to solve yesterday's problem today's problem with yesterday's tools uh, there's a good chance you're not going to be here tomorrow so the impetus to act is today and what i want to do is dig a little bit deeper into the challenge the technical challenge but not only technical uh, and maybe talk a little bit about uh, another way of doing this a way that makes more sense in today's uh, technological landscape, 
uh, and also in today's way of, of architecting a modern software uh, uh, platform uh, and solution. And let's start by the way kind of we've been doing everything for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, this is the traditional approach, the old SOA uh, architecture, service-oriented architecture uh, with ESBs, enterprise service buses. And basically the idea was that if you have an IBMI or any kind of on-prem system, uh, you would basically connect them through that middleware component, which is at the heart of the business, and it basically serves as a pipeline of information throughout the business. Uh, and with that pipeline of information, you can expose both data and processes on your uh, IBMI side to whatever, you know, channel of engagement you had. And back in the days, you know, you had your static HTML pages, which turned into H uh, kind of web 2.0 pages, and then mobile became uh, important. And now there's really kind of an explosion of different ways of interacting with your customers and also with your partners. I mean, it's not just about customer engagement, it's also with uh, um, partners. And the problem with that is that those ESBs, they were created for a very different world. They were created for a world where, you know, high availability was a real issue and you had physical servers and you needed to make sure that the server doesn't, you know, go down. Uh, you had uh, asynchronous, you needed to, all the communication to be basically asynchronous uh, for uh, those kinds of reasons. And also just the speed in which you could deploy your solutions. I mean, it was okay to deploy to production four times a year or two times a year. That was perfectly acceptable. That's really not acceptable today. If you consider, you know, uh, a Facebook, they would deploy to production 10,000 times a day. Now, I'm not suggesting that, you know, every ma manufacturer or a bank or any financial institution should deploy to production 10,000 times a day. But four times a year, that's literally not, you're, you're not even on, on, on the playing field. So you need to move faster. You need to align yourself with a more digital uh, uh, way of, of, of working. And that traditional approach of working through a large middleware that usually contains a lot of business logic, although it shouldn't be. Uh, a lot of people would complain about that. I mean, uh, the middleware is supposed to be completely agnostic, but it contains a lot of business logic, uh, and that becomes a problem to maintain. So using that traditional approach usually leads to uh, the biggest challenge uh, would be just time to value. It would take you a long time to create those digital services. But it's not just about generating the first batch of digital services. It's also the idea of moving to an agile uh, kind of a mindset that work at velocity. Uh, that's a cultural change, but it's also a technical change. And that's basically the idea that you can move fast, that you can uh, respond to the market needs very quickly. Um, and you can't really do that if you don't have the tools to support it, as well as the mindset to support that. And move, making that move, moving from these kind of approaches where, that have been working for the last you know, 15 years, but are not working anymore, moving from them into more modern uh, architectures and more modern approaches, that's basically uh, uh, what we're talking about. And that's basically uh, the kind of the imperative uh, today. So, I mean, just to make it uh, a little bit more real, um, maybe we'll talk about uh, one use case for an insurance company, uh, which are exactly described kind of that types of uh, transformation and those kinds of challenges. And I will ask Marty to uh, maybe talk a little bit about that specific uh, use case. So, Marty? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, this this one, this insurance company really was talking about how one call does it all. You can do one call to actually um, have call center instant quotes. The problem was with their current system, the way it was set up at the time, you really couldn't do that because the, the claimed call center people had to jump between multiple screens to get that done. And it was very painful with, with four different systems, all AS400 machines. So they were really talking about a problem there inside their call center for trying to achieve what their marketing was talking about as a real solution. Um, and they, they really wanted, wanted to stop having to jump between the screens. They really wanted to have the ability to work together in the right way. Um, and, they, and, and so in the end, they actually came, came to uh, 
um, Open Legacy and said, we can do a better job of this, I think. And so the solution was to integrate the AS400 call center claim payment processing and actually not have to do that anymore and actually be able to do instant quote calculations while talking to customers all, all from single screens. And really th this allowed them to have insurance claims sold in the spot. And so what, what their um, applications manager said to us was that the Open Legacy's I API microservice solution was fast to implement and enabled us to expose our AS400 legacy system to our call center customer and payment system using open legacy. We've met the car insurance competitive market demands. And that's very important when you think about a lot of other car insurance companies that, that talk about instant quotes and the ability to do many different things. So, so that's, that's the biggest, biggest issue they were really facing. Now we're going to pass it back over to Zev to discuss um, our approach. Thanks, Mari. So, so we talked about the, the old ways of doing things, but there must be a better way, right? Uh, and there is, that's the good news. And uh, while Open Legacy definitely is the product that, that uh, uh, does that, I mean, it, what, what we would like to talk about is kind of the larger approach uh, of a, what a modern software architecture should look like when it deals with those kinds of legacy and on-prem systems, because those are not going away anytime soon. So instead of, thinking of the problem in terms of large middlewares of kind of trying to boil the ocean with one product that, that does uh, all of the data mapping and transformation and brokering and all of those kind of things. The idea is to basically get, get on the same page as what's happening on the non-enterprise world where it's all about distributed systems and co-generation. Uh, and the idea would be basically to have uh, a kind of a platform, and that's the Open Legacy platform for, for one uh, example, a platform that basically generates tailored uh, solutions for the different processes on your legacy side. So you would have a microservice architecture, and that microservice architecture, basically repre each microservice represents a single uh, business process. And a business process can be as simple as a data inquiry, get customer details, or it can be a more elaborate uh, um, process to, for example, add a, a customer, add an invoice, or do all kinds of, of a more elaborate things. Because it's a microservice, it should not do multiple business uh, processes. It should not do more than one kind of more than one atomic function um, in terms of the business, but it can do more than one atomic function in terms of the technology, uh, in terms of the, 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 the tech involved. So what you would have is kind of a, a mesh of business processes that you can later on uh, choreograph, uh, which is the latest jargon used for uh, what we used to call orchestration. So choreography is basically orchestration without a coordinator. You can choreograph those different business processes into uh, more elaborate uh, outcomes that can support digital uh, channels, that can support um, different partner APIs uh, and, and what have you and allow you to move at velocity because these microservices are completely decoupled. And that's a very important thing. Now, how do you get to that decoupling while you still have the backend application at the end? The way you would do that is by basically employing code generation. So the idea is to automatically generate code uh, in Open Legacy's case, that's Java code that's creating the SDKs. The SDKs are basically just Java components uh, that basically uh, provide the connection to a specific uh, data or functionality on the IBMI side. And that SDK is self-contained. That's just Java object that can populate with the data uh, and run a process. That SDK being automatically generated very quickly is now a gr the grain of a microservice. That microservice provides a contract, a, usually a RESTful contract, but doesn't have to be REST. It can be uh, uh, an event-based contract. And it has some business logic. Now you would ask, well, business lo logic was a problem with you know, the old middlewares of, of before. So why is it not a problem right now? The answer for that is very simple. This is a completely new architecture. And in this architecture, those components are just Java project uh, or code projects. These code projects are now the business process. Having business logic is exactly what they are designed to do. So they are designed to be used in you know, DevOps pipelines and, and, and uh, being saved to uh, Git and, and all those things that you would associate with code project. So basically, this is just an extension of your application, and you would ask 
you know, so what happens to the integration? Why is there not uh, an integration domain here? Why are we not talking integration? Why are we starting to talk about code development and, and, and application development? That's exactly the point. So in this approach, you don't really deal with integration because if you think about it, when you write code and you want to get data from a database, you're not doing integration to the database. You just use the database and you get data from that database. So why would you need all those layers of integration when interacting with an IBMI? That doesn't make any sense. In this approach, you don't do that. You do exactly the same thing as you would approach a database. You just use it, uh, you just use the IBMI function or data. That means that the IBMI in the language of microservices is kind of the data store for that microservice. Now, it is an external data store, so it's not a pure 100% kind of a purist microservice approach, but it's pretty darn close to it. So these microservices, on one hand, they have the SDK communicating with the IBM specific functionality. Uh, on the other hand, they have the API contract, and in between they have some business logic that can be extended. They are completely decoupled from one another, uh, and the only coupling they have uh, to other microservices is through the API contract. That means that essentially you reach the microservice architecture which allow you to move at velocity because you can change those microservices very quickly. You can change the functionality very quickly. You have a good separations between them and the underlying IBMI system because everything is done through this standard SDK, which is just a Java object. You have a good place to put uh, uh, additional business logic, but also you have a good way of orchestrating them into more elaborate experience APIs, just pulling those APIs into other uh, microservices using choreography and exposing specific experiences for mobile, web, wearables, or whatever it is that you want to do. Everything is done on kind of a standardized uh, technology stack. In Open Legacy's case, it's just Java. So essentially, you're getting the best of the microservices world, but you didn't actually pay the price of a migration. And that's the big kind of thing here, because if you could get there, if you just re-architect everything and rewrite all of your code uh, to fit the microservice concept, but then you're migrating your system. And as Alex mentioned before, that's not only uh, uh, very costly and takes a lot of time, but also the risk involved, because those systems contain a lot of uh, know-how and information that uh, has been locked there during the, the years. In this case, you're not touching them. You're just leveraging as, as is. So your trusted IBMI still runs in the background, but it is leveraged in a completely different way by this abstraction mesh or abstraction layer that provides you all the flexibility that you would need from uh, a, a microservice. Now, of course, there are security concerns every time you're trying to open up your legacy system or your uh, uh, on-prem systems to the outside. Maybe to touch on those, some, some of those security aspects, uh, I will ask Marty to chime in. Sure, sure. And I guess what I would say is you, have, is you, can, you can have your cake and eat it too in the security world. And that's a very unusual thing. Um, the reason I say that is IBM I generally have been considered very secure because you actually have logins and, and many different things, whether you're using screens or other methods. Well, we can still allow you to, to do regular logins because our S TK is direct connection to the actual system. That's a choice, but you actually have the ability to cause logins and, th and things like that from the, the web applications as you're doing it. Another thing pe people always liked about it is the fact that it's is the fact that, that your COBOL code um, has strong type checking. Well, so does Java. And this isn't Java like we, we thought 20 years ago, seemed really slow with the JVM. They've done a lot of improvements to increase the speed of Java. So it really is a fast language that has strong type checking, just like COBOL. So those things are things you're used to having. But we also add other things in. We add OAuth 2.0 support built in as part of our platform. And that's a huge advantage um, because that's actually for access management is the way web applications do access management, and that's something you want to have as part of your system. Also, each API is encapsulated. He was discussing this earlier, Zev, a couple minutes ago, but really there's a full encapsulation there to so only see the public functions and everything else is, is private inside of it, and that's a very powerful thing, and it only accesses the specific data you're requesting. If you're requesting um, a record and, and just the record number, you get the record number back. You don't have to get everything else associated with an account, unlike some of the ESB or SOA types where everything came over the pipe. If you broke into that pipe, you got everything. 
we're, we're giving you just what you need as part of the APIs because API is designed to be limited systems. So you really get the type of security you already had and the type of security um, and additional security that's better for the web, both together as options. And that's a very powerful thing. Next thing we're gonna do is talk about cows because we, we promised you lots of cows, right? And for that, we're, we're, I'm gonna hand it over to Zev who's gonna talk about Hakalit. Thanks, Marty. So yeah, so I mean, basically, that's 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 the promise, right, of that new approach. You can have eat the cake and have it too. You can have uh, uh, both uh, standard, really fast, meaning days rather than month, um, and cost-effective approach to modernizing without actually changing anything on your backend application. That's a big promise. Now we can see how that translates into the real world, and of course, that's where, as Marty said, that's where cows come into. Uh, uh, the picture. And this is a, a kind of a, we chose that use case because it's kind of a fun use case. Uh, it has livestock, so that's always fun. Uh, but more importantly, uh, there's a, there's, it's important to think about digital transformation, not as just, you know, those usual examples you would look at. For example, you have an on-prem legacy system, then you want to have, you know, mobile app that's nicer or a web application that, you know, looks more modern. It really is about enabling new things. It's, not, it's about rethinking your business, rethinking what's possible. Uh, and that would translate into a lot of different changes in behavior uh, that are cultural uh, as well as technological. But really, it's expanding your horizons in terms of the possibilities involved. And that's why, uh, that's why I think this use case is, uh, is important and engaging. So in this case, use case, that's the uh, Haklait. That's a veterinarian service company. Uh, the, basically, they're the largest and almost the only uh, veterinarian uh, company in, in Israel. They basically take care of all the livestock, cows, sheep, uh, uh, chickens, what have you. And they have kind of an army of doctors of veterinarians, which are deployed to all the farms. And they would go through a farm, they would check up on the livestock, they will write prescriptions, uh, they will invoice uh, uh, them, uh, they will need, of course, inventory uh, managed, and they will provide healthcare for those uh, animals. Uh, and of course, alert if there are you know, any kinds of disease uh, spreading uh, around. So these doctors, they run around uh, different farms. So in terms of their needs, they need a central system basically to manage all of those things, the invoices and the prescriptions and the inventory and all of those kind of things. Um, they, everything was managed on the IBMI because that's a very robust system. And what the challenges that they had was, first of all, they were using a very kind of antiquated uh, edge uh, equipment, which was this kind of a very old device um, you might recognize them. Uh, some people still use them. Uh, and this device was connected. It, it was built on Windows CE, which is already a, very much a legacy system. Uh, and it was connected to the IBM I. Uh, but the problem is that when you are in a farm in a someplace very far away, you don't necessarily have good internet connection, right? Or wireless connection. So that was a challenge. Also, it didn't really support the way of their working so they had to you know do hacks and work around some issues and really fit the way that they are doing their business to accommodate the application versus the other way around which is how it should be that uh, specifically that offline data issue contributed to a lot of financial issues for them because data was inconsistent so financial records in terms of invoices and things of that sort were really a challenge for them. They always had to kind of reconcile uh, what they had on their system of records with what their uh, doctors were, were showing in, on their handheld devices and something would just get lost in the shuffle and that was a huge problem for them. So in terms of the quality of service that they were able to provide, in terms of the experience for those doctors to be able to function and, and be efficient about it, and in terms of the financial records that they had to keep, uh, all of those things were very flawed, but because that's the way things are done and that's kind of the way that, that integration works, they accepted it. Uh, uh, until they didn't, 
until they realized that there might be, and that's where um, kind of open legacy came into the picture and basically offered them a different way of thinking about the problem and a different way of addressing the problem. And in this case, the solution was very simple, move to a tablet application, and uh, an iPad in this case. Well, it's not just about having the same kind of interface only now in a tablet application. That would be nice, but it wouldn't be really solving all of their problems. Because now that you're moving to a tablet application, you, can, you have the opportunity to do a lot of things very different. And the first of which is kind of disconnect the experience that you get for your uh, end user, in this case, the doctor, disconnected from what, happen, what happens on the backend application. And that's extremely important. Uh, that's really kind of what APIs will do for you. It will help you to decouple the experience that you're getting from the backend if you're doing it right. Uh, that means that you're now no longer beholden to the processes, to the concepts, to the way things are done on the IBMI, which is, you know, worked 15, to, you know, 7, uh, 10, 15 years ago when the system was created, and now it's no longer uh, uh, supporting what you actually want to do. So you want to have different workflows. For example, if you're on a farm and you see some kind of a, uh, um, incident so the disease and, and you want to alert other doctors that it, to keep an eye on it uh, what makes more sense than to just take a picture of it and attach it to whatever report you're uh, uh, um, sending that's exactly the, the kind of experience you would expect but of course the IBMI system was built you know a long time ago and it does not support images uh, so that's just one example uh, of a, cha a different channel of engagement uh, which changes the workflow of what you want to do. Of course, there are a lot of others. For example, uh, if you consider that those terminals, they have very small buttons, it seems like a very simple thing, a very a kind of a basic uh, a thing. I mean, okay, so there are small buttons, but if you consider that you're a doctor and you're wearing a glove because your hand was just, you know, somewhere that don't really want to mention, um, pressing on those small buttons is not necessarily kind of the most convenient way of doing business. So just supporting the workflow uh, of a doctor on the field, that's a, that, that it by itself is a, it provide a lot of efficiencies. But if all of the workflows are derived from what, the way you do business on the IBMI side, then that means you're very much limiting your options. So uh, in this case, what the, the, the actual solution for, for this uh, uh, case was, first of all, create the API from the IB, IBMI system. And creating the, the, the APIs, it, it was not a you know completely simple things to do because as old systems tend to be, it was a very complex protocol, uh, dynamic data areas, and all kinds of uh, complexities. Open Legacy basically took care of all of those things. So in a very short amount of time, around 200 APIs, different APIs were created. These APIs completely decoupled the experience from the backend system of record, but they also allowed. Uh, for solutions, asynchronous solutions to take place so that the device could sync up eventually and maintain integrity of the data uh, when it does. Uh, that also allowed, because of that API experience or API uh, uh, contracts were completely decoupled, that also allowed uh, the uh, uh, agriculture, the Haklait, uh, which is, means the agricultural company, uh, they, it allowed them to go outside and look for uh, a design studio uh, that specializes in creating mobile applications and mobile experiences. And that design studio would go out into the field with the doctors, study exactly how they're doing their business and create the mobile application that fits exactly their needs uh, and, and, the, and the way that they want to do business. And that stu design studio didn't need to know and didn't care about the origin of those APIs. They didn't know about IBMI. They didn't know about dynamic work uh, uh, um, uh, communication areas and th things of that nature, they didn't know and they didn't care. They just built the experience that they thought was the ideal experience for the situation and the APIs supported that. So in this case, the experience for the doctors was greatly improved, the experience for their customers was greatly improved, but also the, uh, um, uh, the integrity of the financial data was greatly improved. And on top of that mobile application, they were able to add more and more functionality, GPS tracking and, and all of those kind of things uh, that are possible once you are going digital and you can expand a little bit your horizon. So that's kind of the doorway into uh, new uh, 
business lines, into new revenue streams, into doing more and more with, with what you have. And basically the idea is that this is a way for you to take those on-prem and legacy systems that are usually regarded kind of as an anchor to the business and really transform them into the engine of the business because they hold a tremendous amount of value and they can be leveraged in new ways in order to provide that value uh, further down to customers. So that's that use case uh, in terms of the numbers. I mean, these are 200 APIs that were generated very quickly in a matter of uh, uh, a couple of weeks, uh, basically uh, handling around 65,000 sync requests. Uh, again, these are uh, synchronized requests that might uh, synchronize even a day after the actual request was done, and they are consolidated into financial records, uh, which removed all of the data inconsistency uh, in those cases. So they saw tremendous value in using the platform and in using uh, this approach. So that's kind of the, the, the uh, uh, one use case, which again, is a, it's a little bit of a fun use case because it involves cows and sheep, uh, sheep and, and chickens. But of course, you can see how that is applicable to basically any kind of industry, whether it's you know, agents going out there on the field or it's just improving the experience of uh, customer service people or improving the experience of customers themselves. And of course, improving the experience of working with partners uh, uh, and creating a digital ecosystem around your business, which is today, I would suggest, might be one of the biggest challenges for a lot of uh, enterprises and organizations. Um, so, I mean, just to end up here, and if we move to the, the kind of a, Last, uh, uh, last slide, just to sum it up, uh, this is what it looks like in terms of the overall process, right? So you start with an on-prem system, in this case, the IBM I, of course, this approach is applicable to any kind of backend application, legacy application, uh, whatever, if it doesn't play well with others, uh, that, that's, that's a good approach for it. Uh, basically automating the uh, access to it using this code generation process, which the Open Legacy Platform uh, provides. Um, it can be accessed through different protocols, uh, basically talking natively with not only the system, but more specifically with the specific uh, applications, business functionalities. Uh, it might be even green screens in some cases, the databases, whatever. The main idea is to create that SDK that exposes that functionality or, or abstracted that functionality and then can be further designed um, as an API, uh, business logic added to it. Um, this can be a very test-driven de uh, de development cycle. So you can test those SDKs separately from the APIs. That's a huge advantage. We can talk about some of those uh, DevOps implications. Uh, um, we, we can talk about them if there's any, any questions around that, but that's a huge thing uh, for just uh, being able to create consistent code uh, at Velocity. Um, and of course, you can use the entirety of the DevOps ecosystem around Java in Open Legacy's case um, to deploy automatically. Deployment can be done anywhere on prem, on the cloud, any cloud, OpenShift, Docker, Kubernetes, whatever cloud environment. Uh, and this whole process can be highly automated uh, and inserted into kind of a DevOps uh, pipeline. So that's, that's uh, kind of. Uh, um, um, of course, every topic that we talked about can be expanded and, and be talked about much further. Uh, but I'll, I will stop here and uh, because I do see some uh, questions uh, that are uh, accumulating. So uh, I'll stop here and I'll move it to Marty to take the questions. Okay. So, um, thank you very much. So I think the first question is kind of a funny one. Do, do cows have barcodes? Is that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's that's a uh, funny question. Yeah. So, um, yeah. In in cows do have barcodes. They have tags. Uh, in this case, to be honest, uh, the um, the basic unit was a farm, not a cow. Uh, but cows do have tags, uh, which is used for other systems. So, uh, on general, the answer is yes. But specifically in this case, uh, it what cow tags were not used in the system. It was based on farms uh, or uh, we don't want to get into the details, but uh, the sub subunit of farms. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I guess another, another question just came in. Can we get a recording of the session? Yes, we're recording the session, and we're going to we're going to post it on our website um, afterwards. So you'll you'll be able to see a recording of the session. 
Um, as, as, far, as far as another question, technical question, I guess um, we'll ask, do we have any real user use case scenarios with DevOps with IBM I applications? I guess I'll cover that one. Um, and I'll mention the fact that we have I alone, who's another customer in Israel, um, who actually is an insurance company. And they use DevOps to actually use Open Legacy to, to enhance their DevOps process. This is from AS400 applications. And, we, and they're actually going to talk on the next webinar, uh, on a webinar next week, May 14th, and actually, which is available off our website. You can link to it. And it's on DevOps.com, all about this. Eldad Omar, their CTO, is going to talk about how they actually leverage DevOps. They leverage things like Kubernetes. And they used our, um, our infrastructure, which includes the microservices that, that, that you build from the, from the AS400 applications directly in to make that all work. So it's a very powerful feature. Um, and, and it'll be great to hear about that separately um, on the webinar next week. And now we're going to go to another question, um, which is, wh what if we need to use event queuing? Do you support that? I'll, I'll let Zev answer that one. Yeah, so the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, as, as we mentioned, I mean, the interfaces the, uh, are separated from the SDKs and are separated from the business logic. So the interface that you're creating can be a RESTful inter interface, but it can also be a message interface. And message interface can be leveraged with uh, Kafka or RabbitMQ or even MQ, uh, uh, WebSphereMQ by, by IBM. Uh, so absolutely, the answer is yes. And that kind of is important because that gives you the flexibility to to um, you leverage the APIs in multiple ways. So they can be leveraged for synchronous things, user engagement and stuff like that, but also in asynchronous ways. Uh, and you can basically leverage the same code base, quote unquote, uh, for doing everything. So that's a very important distinction. Uh, and I would always urge everybody to rethink the way uh, they, they are architecture their system because today a lot of times people are using MQ just as a general communication protocol. And really I would suggest that everybody think about it again and really uh, uh, do some, some basically fit for purpose, rethink their, their business processes as to what needs to be synchronous and what needs to be asynchronous and really have the best solution for, for each. And of course we can help with that with our, um, uh, experience and expertise, uh, but that's a very important question today. Whether, when do you need to use asynchronous and when do you need to, to use synchronous? But in terms of the technology and what it enables, absolutely it enables uh, both types of scenarios. Great, thank you very much. If anyone else has any questions, please make sure to um, submit them through the Q&A tab. Um, we appreciate very much questions, um, but we do have one more left here which is what, what do you do in support of SAP? And I guess I'll take that one. We do mention SAP in the slide and we actually, um, it's the same as other applications, except we go from the BAPI, which is the business API. We can generate or automate the generation of actual APIs. We can even automate the generation of Angular HTML. And for some customers, this is a huge benefit because um, the, the, the internal tools, number one, take a while to use and step through to, to get to APIs. Number two, they don't produce REST APIs. They produce OData, which are less common, so it's actually harder to, to get other people to help you with actually gener building HTML. And the HTML they generate is based on UI5, which again is less common, not as much of a standard. So there's a lot of reasons why people really like using SAP. For SAP, we, we like using our solution um, directly because we automate that whole generation, make it fast, quick, and we can even generate the HTML pages, which can be much more generic and much more usable for a lot of people. And we do that for both um, regular BAPIs and also for custom ones or called x -BAPIs. So a number of different things there. And when we have some great customers that are using SAP. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's about it. Um, do you have anything else to add, um, Zev or Alex? Yeah, so I mean, just to come to generalize the last question. I mean, yeah, we do support, of course, SAP. We do support BAPI and ZBAPI and we support uh, automatic generation of, uh, uh, of web interfaces both for sap and for other systems uh, that that's all true but in a more general way i mean a, a way to think about it is not just with specific you know back-end applications in mind of, of course uh, uh well these are extremely important I t it's it's a different approach about thinking about integration right so it's thinking about integration that is we would almost call it integration less integration so uh it's basically integration done through web uh, th sorry, through app development. 
And it is really a modern approach that is consistent with the way you would do um, just normal app development if you were an emerging company. So this approach allows you to kind of become modernized in a real sense, not just in terms of, yeah, I have a, you know, a web application on top of my old legacy system, but really modernize in the way that you are building your applications, in the way you are maintaining your application, in the way you are deploying your application, but also in the results that you're getting uh, in terms of velocity and the ability to move very, very quickly. And literally, we have customers doing in days what otherwise would take them uh, a month and months, you know, six to nine months uh, to do. So it's a completely different approach. It incorporates uh, some uh, new thinking, and that's always a challenge. Uh, you have to uh, rethink about things and, and not take for granted some of the concepts that were there for a lot of time. Sometimes that's a bit of a challenge for people to do. But once you see the result of that approach, basically you understand that you were able to move to a completely modern architecture without paying a price of a migration, which is a, a big thing for a lot of our, uh, of our customers. So that's kind of on a grander scale. Uh, that's, that's what the approach does for you. Uh, and of course, you know, for the specific platforms that we support, that we support a lot of those, probably if you have a question about the platform, whether or not we support it, probably the answer would be yes, we do support it. Uh, and we encourage everybody to uh, reach out and, and if they have specific uh, challenges, uh, we'll be more than happy to engage. Thank you very much. And I guess, so we're, we're, we're saying a recording out uh, um, of, of this webinar tomorrow and we also um, have, and, and, and we also have done it, um, it also be available on our website. So we have a couple different options there for you to get it and we're excited to, um, to, to work with everybody and thank you very much. And thank you, Alex and Zev. Thanks, Mario. Thank you, Mario. All right.